but it was right place right time and that's like i say yes to a lot of things for those reasons you never know what you're going to get out of it and even when i walked into that room and sat down with 200 people and i'm like the fuck am i doing here? <laughs> who are all these women? are they all broken like me you know and you yeah. and it's a week of intensive work but in a group setting it just kind of unlocks something else if i keep doing what i'm doing what's the definition of insanity what is einstein doing the say? same thing over and over again and this is where i see such a parallel to nutrition and what you're saying about control so keep going the things you start learning about control is you can control your word. In a lot of cases, notice how often we lie to ourselves. So we lose trust with ourselves. You may not break your promise with your friend across the street, but with you, you're like, oh, I'll go to the gym tomorrow. Oh, I'll start my diet tomorrow. Oh, I'll create this new habit tomorrow. And then you just don't do it. Again, we can't control a lot. We can't control how we show up. We can control our word. We can control the effort of being on time, obviously, if something happens. So I think a final closing line and a keynote I gave about really just embodying it. Perfect. Let's hear it. Life is the sum of our choices. And what I know for sure is that we can't control everything, but we can control the choices that we make. All that we can really do is control our actions and put in the effort to share truth. The outcome is unknown, but you can choose who you want to be and how you want to show up. Let's link up with Krista on The Fix. She's a wellness coach with a focus on mental well-being and physical strength. What is up, Fix listeners? Welcome back to our latest episode of The Fix Podcast. I'm your host, Krista Huber, and I have quite a guest with a beautiful, powerful conversation today where we cover so many different topics. I'm really excited to let all of you right into this episode. And it's just a very deep conversation that will get you thinking about your career choices, how you look at money, how you make decisions in your life based off of other people and usually other people's best intentions, but the track and the path that you write for yourself and how sometimes we put ourselves in positions that we feel stuck in because we continue to make choices that we believe in our heart of hearts that there's no other way and that this is what we are supposed to do. And this is a story of someone who really challenged a lot of that and really started to think about why he was showing up the way he was, what it meant for him to be a leader in his own life, how he struggled with depression, what it was like to deal with bankruptcy, so many different things. And that is Ruben Rojas, who is an extremely talented artist. But as you'll hear right at the beginning of this episode, he wears many hats, one of which includes being a dad. And I just know that there's at least one, two, if not about 15 different nuggets that you could take away from this one. This is one of those episodes that you'll probably want to listen to a couple of times. And I guarantee every time you listen to it, you're going to take something different away from it. I was taking so many notes every time Ruben started to dive a little bit deeper into another part of his story and how he's gotten to where he is today. I couldn't stop coming up with lists of questions and I could have had him on for truly three hours. So I was really moved by this. I think so many of you out there are going to be too. And if there's a part that really stands out, I'd love to hear from you. We love putting this podcast out every single week. I get so much pleasure and passion off of getting the chance to just sit down and meet somebody and get to know their story and have over an hour of uninterrupted time with them. And sometimes I hear from you guys and I can't tell you how much I appreciate knowing that the podcast impacted you in some way, even if it was something really small, even if it was just a couple seconds of a certain clip. Whenever I say at the beginning of these episodes, reach out, send me a DM. I really mean it. And I love to know what resonates. I love to know what you want to hear more about. So don't be shy. Reach out, DM me at the Krista Huber or at the fix.official pod. But I think this is an episode that is certainly going to be one of our top recordings for 2023, if not for the whole year. So with that, welcome Ruben Rojas to the Fix Podcast. Ruben. 
Ruben, welcome to The Fix Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here today. Like I was just saying, before we hit the record button, there's so much for us to talk about. We can take this conversation in probably a million in one direction. So we'll see where it goes. But to kick things off and get us warmed up, whenever I have a guest on The Fix Podcast, I like to ask them two questions. And the first is just a fun icebreaker. I'm a big coffee drinker. I never skip my morning cup. I love a good latte. So I'd like to know, how do you enjoy your coffee in the morning? What do you like to sip on? Do you have it next to you? Perfect. Uh, uh, I do one even better. Hold on. Hold on. It just happens to be... This is, this is the stuff. Look at that. Strong the plug coffee. for strong. Very nice. And there's Tuesday. And Tuesday's a big fan of strong coffee too. Of course. If daddy loves it, he loves whatever daddy loves. <laughs> so what do you, when you make your strong coffee, what are you putting in there? Hot water Black. and powder. I okay. have, I have toyed around with putting it in coffee already. That was just too much. That too was much. just too much. There was a time in my life where I drank a lot of red eyes. Okay. And what strong did for me, and this is why I love it. It's, I like lattes. Like I'm into lattes. Milk doesn't bother me and all that, but you go to Starbucks or coffee bean, you drink one of these lattes. I'm just drinking chemical poison at the mm-hmm. time. I didn't even realize it. My tongue liked it. But when you start maturing your palate and sure. learn different things, you're like, mm, this isn't the greatest thing. But he, Adam Von Rothfeller created a product that satiates my latte cravings and love and here we are i love it problem yeah chase has always told me that too like the first time he had the latte pack he was just so impressed that it actually really is the same kind of experience and consistency Mm -hmm. even despite the way you're making it so i think that's super cool love it yeah awesome it's only 135 calories it's got protein it's got all the things there you go And if anybody out there deals with, you know, being a little anxious and things like that, the L-theanine is a great ingredient to add into the mix, especially if you're a big coffee drinker like me and you maybe need to pull back a little bit. So we like that. Very nice. You have an an IV just plugged into the vein? I, if I shouldn't, but there was definitely a time in my life where I was drinking way more coffee than I am now. So I've really tried to pull back, but I just love the taste. Like it's not even about the caffeine for me. I just really appreciate it. No. Yeah, exactly. You can, yeah. I could drink it and go to bed. I'm Colombian. It's in my blood. So. There you go. Perfect. Well, we're in good company. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, we're going to take it in a very different direction now. And I have a feeling just based on listening to other interviews, listening to your own podcast, that we'll probably go pretty deep pretty quickly. But I want to know beyond the resume, beyond the artwork that you create, beyond how you got here, you can give us like the 30 second spiel on who you are. But more specifically, I want you to answer that question of who is Ruben, but why should we care about what you have to share with us today? Why should the Fix listeners keep listening to the rest of this podcast? Yeah, Fixies. Um, Who am I? You know what's funny is the first mural I painted asked the question, who will you be? Wow. Because, Because I had no idea. And it's not that I didn't know. I feel like we don't ask ourselves, who do we want to be? Who are we? We don't give ourselves permission. Mm. And we have X amount of years, you know, hopefully a good, I'm thinking 125 over here for me. Sounds great. uh, Healthy, amazing life. And like, who are we going to be from year one to year 125? Who knows? We're going to evolve. We're going to change. So who am I? I'm still discovering, right? I'm always going to be different. It's always going to be seasonal. It's always going to be evolving like recently i'm now a dad as part of the resume but am i all these titles and definitions no i'm i guess the best way i could say is is, is this, I'm, I'm a man that's trying to be the best i can be every single day and i'm going to fail because we are fallible and go back into my bunks and all those things that have happened but as long as i continue moving forward to get out of that but i am an artist and i don't believe in trying to add all these titles like i'm a podcast host and a sculptor and a muralist and a clothing designer and an activist and a philanthropist and like all of a sudden you're like hmm. i'm ruben let's keep it easy <laughs> <laughs> well let's continue with that thread of you're an artist because something that stood out to me in a lot of the interviews i listened to where you were being interviewed and sharing your story is you've mentioned that while you explored different fields, you're in finance, real estate, 
you know, thought you might be a doctor at one point, you always come back by ending it and saying that you always have considered yourself an artist. So tell me why that is, and maybe talk us through some of the examples of how that's kind of shown up in your life, even as a young kid. Yeah, I think early on when I talk about this, I, I need to preface it that I've always been an artist because sometimes I'm like, did you just wake up one day and realize that you had this gift or this skill? Sure. I'm like, no, it was always there. And what's yeah. important in the story is who are we listening to and who are we allowing to be in our ears telling us who we're going to be or need mm -hmm. to be or want to be, you know, at some point I thought, yeah, I want to be a doctor. I want to be an orthopedic surgeon. I'm a three sport athlete. It makes sense. I was yeah. into fitness and sports my whole life. Um, usually jocks go into the orthopedic space, right? <laughs> and I did a lot of personal training. Fitness is a big component of my background. So science was also easy. It, I could just go in, listen and get A's. So and you want to make your parents proud, you know, go to sure. school, go be a doctor, go be a lawyer, go be a banker, go get the, you know, quote unquote job. So that I think is why it's so important for me to say, hey, I've always been an artist. It's just I did all these other things avoiding that. And it's part of it is I wasn't listening that that's what I was supposed to be. And also at 12, who I mean, at some point I was going to be an astronaut. I was going to be a veterinarian. I was going to be. I don't know, a pro athlete, who knows all the different things that I was right. going to be in my life. And even now, new things pop up, like opportunities. I hosted a TV show a year and a half ago. I'm still looking at another show. So maybe this artist thing is not just art. So I say I'm an artist, but like we could be in art in multiple things. It's, it's who we're being. But I listen to everybody else. Hey, you should do this. And you're like, yeah, I'm a good son. I'll just listen to the things and people tell us what to do it's in the, it, they're not trying to do us harm right no. they think it's it's in our best interest but it's not you know we need to listen to ourselves. so let's take that advice and let's marry it with our advice let's take inventory and say who are we what do i want to be and guess what maybe today that's that and tomorrow it's something else what we don't want to be is up and down all over the place like a richter scale because then we're never <laughs> going to become anything a whole another set of uh, issues. Sure. But, but yeah, I just, I listened to people, you know, at some point, and not only did I listen to people, I listened to the, to the world because the way I ended up in real estate and continuing down the path was money. I made a lot of money out the gate and I'm like, medical school debt. What's that going to look like? There's the thought you're going to make a lot of money as a surgeon, but still that's like, it's 10 delayed. Years out. Right. Yeah. Or, Ooh, 18 grand my first month in real estate now i'm 20 nothing and the world says you are successful you are important you are worthy you belong by the success that you make money wise so i fell into that also i'm just i'm young and dumb and full of bravado so at 20 of course i'm gonna go chase money what else am i gonna look at and then that means i get the nice car the nice house House, the boat brings all the girls I got the table at the club <laughs> like you live that lifestyle yeah and not poo-pooing any of that I think whatever it is that we do let's find the purpose and the meaningful reasons behind it and my reason at that time wasn't meaningful it's just I needed more diamonds and I needed more shoes and I needed bigger rims and so 2008 hits I lose it all and I go bankrupt I'm like mm, here I am with no money you know, does that mean I'm broken or unworthy or unsuccessful or any of that? No. Did but you think that at the time, though? Oh, I was like, what the hell am I going to do with my life? Who? Yeah. Are, what? What? What is happening here? What is next? Like, at that time, you think I didn't even think I was going to do that forever, but I just thought I would keep making more and more and more. And I've always been entrepreneurial. Like, I've started a few not above board businesses in my early youth. Uh, I'm paying my way through things that I want so I've always been a self-starter and like if I want something yo mom can I get this she's like no we give you plenty you don't lack anything but if you want to go get something you go earn figure money and out. figure it out so sure. mm -hmm. 
She didn't say how to do it, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I figured it out. So, you know, long story short, in, in two thousand, I'm at the bottom of this depression. Not, I wasn't even depressed yet. I was still fine. The depression came after this. I got out ahead of myself. I was at the bottom of this bankruptcy, but I felt like I had no purpose. And I'm like, I'm in my twenties. I'm like, what am I gonna do in my life? This is all I knew for the past couple of years. And it was Vegas every other week. And like, it was a lot of money. And I didn't even have, to, I didn't even cash my checks. Like they would just sit in the drawers. Cause I'm like, I don't need this much. So let me just let it sit there. Right. But, but, and then I get a DUI at the same time. So not only did I go bankrupt, have no credit, everything's gone. Then I get this $10,000 DUI. This is pre Uber and all that. Mind you, there's no excuses ever, but um, at that time we didn't have Uber, but it's also the incident was all BS too, but it was karma for the time that it should have really been caught. And you so got away like, with it. Yeah, exactly. So we all have those moments. Don't sure. act like innocent unless you're a hundred percent sober, but no judgment. Um, then I listened to a few people, you know, my mom was in financial services at some point. She's like, go into insurance and retirement service. It's great girlfriend at the time's dad's like yeah go into insurance and retirement services so that's how I find myself going down the path of financial advisor okay listening to other people again again out of the goodness of their heart it wasn't like they were trying to steer me in the wrong way they're sure. like you can succeed at this so I start doing that I get in leaders conference rookie of the year start doing really well again start making money again the difference this time is I started realizing earlier the reason that I kept seeking money and that mattered so much is a I loved the competition of it but b that's how I thought I was successful that's how I thought I had self-worth that's how mm. I thought I belonged in this case after you lose it you're like no I it mean, doesn't mean as much I, yeah exactly and then I go into this career again all of these are great careers. Nothing papooing at the at the peri the career. I can't talk today, <laughs> but uh, I didn't find the value in being measured by money again, and I didn't find value in all these things. I like nice things. I like making money. Don't get me wrong. This isn't. I'm not a charity case where I live in a box, but it doesn't drive me the same way. Right? Success looks a little bit different, and I'm like. What does purpose look like? And I found some purpose in the career, but five years into it, I started seeing examples in my other clients where they're divorced, their their kids resent them, they have bad marriages because they're in jobs they hate. But you just you could create this life where you're trapped, and they're like, "Well, I bring in money, so then it, and I have a job." But there's so much more to life, and I'm like, I didn't want to see that. So I started seeing, well, that that could be me. My kids could then resent me for not being around because I work or let's say I am around I'm just at home an angry a-hole I can't walk wipe the stank off my face you can't hide that and I can say well here's all the money I made you like I'm like they don't want to see that I don't want like a, a divorce or a bad marriage because I stuck it out in something and sacrificed my life and was just unhappy so that's when five years in I'm like I'm depressed what am I doing with my life? You know, I start avoiding everything. Um, I actually used CrossFit and competing in CrossFit as a way to take up a lot of my day, you know, because when you're trying to get to the highest levels, you're training four or six hours a day, sure. which is not really the healthiest thing either. But, um, you know, you start avoiding things with other things. And, you know, I found myself like, what's wrong with me? Um, I live in LA. I'm single, no baggage rebuilt my credit like I'm back to like good yeah and you're I'm an eligible good. bachelor over there exactly all the things mm -hmm. and I'm just looking at myself like who am I to be depressed you know and went and did some work signed up to like a leadership workshop started digging in and unpacking some stuff and learned like yo what's this being a leader of my own life what's it look like who will you be asking me these questions what is the look like to really start taking charge and uh, I think we believe we are in control more often than we know knowingly that we're not 
But when you start taking responsibility and start becoming a leader of your life, you can start taking back the little bit of control that you can actually have, right? We can't control yeah. a lot of things. And that's what led me to this. There's so much in there that I want to touch on. But I think the biggest common thread that I'm hearing and a lot of this, you know, when you can relate to somebody's experiences, we're going to imprint our own experience onto it and the way we listen to it and the lens that we have. But I think the biggest thing that stood out for me and you just walking through that whole story and thank you for sharing it is the level of self-awareness that you started to develop. Mostly it seems like initially because you had a struggle, right? You got to the point of losing everything, being bankrupt, but I'd love to know now that you're several years removed from all this and now you're in a different space and mindset and everything in your life. Why do you think for so many people, like you hear that story, it always takes the, you know, your mess is your message. The idea that like you have to hit a rock bottom before you make some kind of change. Why do you think that we're not taking enough time, creating enough space, whatever it is to get in touch with figuring out our purpose, get in touch with figuring out who we are. Because like you, the thing that stuck out to me the most in what you said is I reached a period of depression in my life where I also felt like I had no right to be depressed. I was this person who I was taking a lot of external advice from professors, from college alumni, from parents, siblings, all who had great intentions for me. They wanted the best for me. They wanted to guide me based on their experiences and what they knew, right? Just like you were saying about your own parents. But I got to a place where I just, I didn't like the job. I was very unhappy in my relationship. I was actually about to get married. I canceled my engagement. I called off the wedding six months before. And I was so stuck because I struggled with the fact that I made all those decisions. So when I was really depressed, I was like, I don't have a right to be depressed about this because I put myself in this position and I was ready to take full ownership and responsibility of that. But Mm -hmm. going back to the question and just kind of reflecting on the experiences you've had and what you've learned from it, why do you think so many people aren't able to make the realizations that you and I can if they haven't hit some kind of rock bottom, like those clients that you were paying attention to who were clearly stuck and clearly miserable? Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a few things. A, we're afraid, period. We're afraid. We are in denial. We are lying to ourselves. And and I think also like using a false sense of gratitude. Mm. It's not like true gratitude, but like we're using it like, well, at least I have all this. Yeah, the justification. Exactly. And then obviously to make ourselves right, because we love being right, we're humans we go seek out people in the same situation and then we commiserate. Hey, well, I guess this is you too. So I guess this is what we do. And then on the weekends you hang out and complain and then you go back to work and can't wait for the weekend again to rinse and repeat. Yeah, There's a lot of autopilot. Uh, I hope no one has to hit rock bottom. But if you look back at the studies, right? The deathbed stuff, final confessions of people, No one ever says, I wish I had another Lamborghini or a bigger house, or they say, I want more time. I wish I traveled more. I wish I hung out more. So like, I hope people realize it sooner than later because time goes, I mean, I just had my kid. He was like this big and now he's 34 inches tall, two and a half. And before you know, he's going to be 20. Yeah. Everyone says that as soon as you have kids, it really makes you appreciate how much faster time goes by because Mm -hmm. you're constantly measuring it with each new school, all of it. Yeah. Cause you see them growing in front Mm -hmm. of you. That is a, that is like your shadow. That is like your, like, it's like, (laughs) wow, he's that he's, he's almost three. Oh my gosh. He's four, you know? Yeah. It's, it's really interesting how, you know, I I actually recorded a podcast on this that I released today and I've been thinking about it since because I listened to a podcast that gave me this idea, but it's all about how you write the narrative of your past and the fact that you can actually write your past in the present moment. 
because you can change it. Like how you choose to remember yesterday or the day before, I think is so interesting. And I was just talking to our mutual friend Chase about this today because I listened to a podcast with Dr. Benjamin Hardy, who Chase is actually Mm -hmm. having on the show. And I said in my own recording, I was like, I'd love to get this guy on the show. And he was like, don't worry, I already took care of it for you. I'm going to make it happen. I was like, I guess we were manifesting over here. And um, I just thought it was so cool to hear that because of what you just said about control and us realizing that we do actually have a lot more that we can control that we don't think we do. But I'd love for you to just kind of describe that a little bit more in the context of what you mentioned about taking leadership courses and how you kind of got into that space. Cause it sounds like from what I understand of your story, that was ultimately the catalyst for the work that you do now today in terms of the physical art that you're producing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Benjamin Hardy is awesome. I just sat down with him last week. Nice, I'm super um, excited to meet him. Yeah, it's 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 it was a fun combo. So yeah, right from your future self. A lot of us live not from the past, but in the past. Yeah. You know, if you live live you're living in your past, they say you're living more in depression. If you're living in your future, you're living in anxiety. And mm. if you're doing either, you're just not present. But right. you can mer- merge it all together. So I'm excited to get that episode out. But a lot of it was right place, right time. If I didn't already ask all the questions of like, to be frank, like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? Like, what, what am I going to do? Where can I go? What book can I read? Like, it was right place, right time. My buddy's like, yo, come get some coffee with me. I want to share what I'm doing. If I wasn't in this position, would I have signed up for what the hell I'd signed up for? Yeah. Probably not. Right. Um, knowing me and just whatever but it was right place right time and that's like I say yes to a lot of things for those reasons you never know what you're going to get out of it and even when I walked into that room and sat down with 200 people and I'm like the fuck am I doing here (laughs) who are all these weirdos are they all broken like me (laughs) you know and you and it's a week of intensive work and uh this is early this is before emotional intelligence just became this buzzword but the work isn't new this stuff is ancient you know some people might know it as uh oh, what's the stuff landmark that's like what the Lou lemon crew goes through yeah or stuff that tony robbins does or any of that it's just doing a lot of different work that's out there it is available but in a group setting it just kind of unlocks something else so it was right place right time and just being open to something different like if, if i keep doing what i'm doing What's the definition of insanity? What is Einstein doing the same thing over and over again? And this is where I see such a parallel to nutrition and what you're saying about control. So keep going. Yeah. So, so then it came down to the the things you start learning about control is you can control your word. Right. And, and in a lot of cases, notice how often we lie to ourselves and break our own promises. So we lose trust with ourselves. You Mm. may not break your promise with your friend across the street. But with you, you're like, oh, I'll go to the gym tomorrow. Oh, I'll start my diet tomorrow. Oh, I'll create this new habit tomorrow. And then you just don't do it. But you'll tell your friend, oh, I'll be there at six. Yeah. Um. So, so again, we can't control a lot. We can't control how we show up. We can control our word. We can control the effort of being on time, obviously, if something happens. it's But, but there's very little thing. So let's focus on what we can actually do do and start working on ourselves and the habits and the reasons um and that's about it so i think i the final closing line and a keynote i gave um i'm not gonna remember the words i'll look it up but uh it was about really just embodying it perfect let's hear it Life is the sum of our choices and what i know for sure is that we can't control everything but we can control the choices that we make All that we can really do is control our actions and put in the effort to share truth. The outcome is unknown, but you can choose who you want to be and how you want to show up. It's beautiful. I love the fact that you also use the word action in a juxtaposition against outcome, because that's actually something I focus on so much with my nutrition clients. And I actually was giving a presentation last night 
I work with local gyms. I go into their gym and they might already have the fitness side of things nailed down their strength training. They're getting their cardio in, but they feel like something's missing. And for most of them, that's, they're not paying attention to what's on their plate. So I provide the nutritional guidance and we do it in a group setting. It's awesome. We all get in the room together every Wednesday night, people ask questions. And last night's focus was all about goal setting. And I talked about habits, pulled a lot from James Clear and Atomic Habits, one of my favorite books ever. And one of the biggest principles that I really wanted everyone to pay attention to was to focus on the actions and the behavior, not the outcome. A really easy example being we throw around this idea that you have to get 10,000 steps a day, which is a total arbitrary number, right? I could argue that that's actually less than I need because as a trainer, sometimes I'm getting 20,000 steps a day. I'm not sitting all the time, right? So I was explaining to this group because a lot of people were like, do I need to get an Apple watch? Do I have to get a Garmin? Do I need to track my steps? And I was like, you're focusing on the outcome. There you go. You got both. You got your whoop. You got your Apple watch. I got my Garmin. We're fully represented. I got my aura ring, all of it. I love the data from it, but it's not actually necessary when you focus on the behavior because you could simply say, Hey, you know, that you probably need to move your body a little bit more. You work at a desk, you're kind of sedentary. You get your 45 minutes in the gym, but then maybe you're walking your dog for 10 minutes and that's it. So instead of focusing on this outcome of creating this goal of, I have to get 10,000 steps a day, how about instead we make a commitment to a new behavior of, I'm going to add a 20 minute walk every single day, because that actually guarantees the outcome you're trying to inch closer towards, right? It's the Delta. It's the increase. You're getting more than what you would have gotten before. And I think too often people get really stuck on this idea of like where they want to go that they don't pay attention to how they're going to get there. And that's like what you were saying earlier about if you're living in the future versus actually being in the present moment. Yeah. It's like living. I know when I get mostly frustrated is when I'm living from expectations. Sure. And then you're like, wait, did I even align with my own commitments and agreements or for whoever's working for me or the team Mm. to then get to the expectation and like oh we skipped all of this <laughs> you know I mean and I've done health and training and nutrition and, and all that with clients in my you know that's what I studied so I always tell people the six pack is the byproduct that should never be your why if you happen mm-hmm. to get one awesome and they're like well I want to look like you like look I've had one forever I have genetics thank you mommy and daddy Obviously, I have really good habits, but if I trained for a six pack, you're going to take every shortcut, steroids, yo-yo diets, hours of cardio, starving myself, and it's just not something you can actually maintain. So a lot of the things is like, you you don't want it bad enough, and your why is not strong enough. Totally. Like, what is your why? So why do I train? I always jokingly say the zombie apocalypse, I'm not getting eaten. I'm going to save my family, but I want to play with my grandkids. Yeah. I'm 75. I want to run around with them and play with them. I'm a very physical, active person. You said you were living to 125. So that better be part of the the why, right? Yeah. And the happy byproduct is the six pack. Cool. I'll take it every single day. Just like if you look at before working for money or working for whatever, money is the happy byproduct. Like one day I will have the Lamborghini Urus as my dream car that I want. But the difference is I'm not doing it to satisfy a a self-worth, lack of whatever. Something's missing inside of you. It's because, A, I love cars. I'm a car guy through and through. I know everything about it. It's like, cool. it's just something uh, uh, that I can have a goal to. But if I don't get it or, hey, I could get it and I don't need it. Mm -hmm. Those are different reasons. But that's the happy byproduct. Like, Every day I do what I do and I do what I love. And honestly, if I was independently wealthy, I would never even care about money, but I do got to pay the bills and raise a family and scale this thing. And it takes money to grow something. But half the battles, like, I mean, I would just do it. So get to the point of just doing it. Fall in love with yourself so much that the nutrition is what you need. And also, if if you're on a small plan, give yourself the 90 days. Give yourself 90 days in everything, right? First 30 days in the gym. You're actually going to gain weight. The middle 30 days, you're like, nothing's happening. Mm. Day 91 will be like, oh, hey, yeah. But we never get past 
seven days, right? Or mm -hmm. maybe 21. I, it's so, yeah, I mean, I, I use a lot of fitness as analogies um, because it's about the, the, the results are a bad product. It's not the finish line. You know, everything you're doing is the journey. Look how much you're learning. And I've, I've talked to people with nutrition problems and I mean, crying, depression, all of that. Like we could do that in everything. It's just a great space to think about. It's like, what are you not taking care of inside that's making you eat the cupcake? Yep. Or binging in the closet or not eating or yo-yo diet. Like, where's the shame? Where's the guilt? Where's, where's the thing that's keeping you from loving yourself? Those are the questions that you need to ask. The question shouldn't be, I look at carbs and get fat, so I'm just not going to eat carbs, right? Question mark. I'm like, or, oh, I can't do that. Or I can't do that. No, it's like, what, is, what do I need here? Because I also tell people, if you're on a plan and you're craving cake, eat the fucking cake. Just make it yep. count. Don't make it a Twinkie. Because what you're going to do is eat the salad, eat the apple, eat a snack, eat everything leading up Around to the cake. It. And you're mm -hmm. still going to eat the cake. You yep. just added all these calories on top of it. Sure. So true. Oh, and that actually, that, yeah. right. And that actually ties back to the control concept in a false sense of control. And I think I see this a lot and I'm sure you have too in working with clients. Often, if we don't get through some of the surface level when it comes to these nutrition conversations, like what you said about what's missing inside, what I like to call my clients like to label as like the fuck it moments where it's like mm -hmm. they know on paper what they should be doing, but for whatever reason, they're not doing it. And they hate answering that question. And I actually just said to my clients in a group call we did on Tuesday night, I have been able to create this community and a coaching program that is going to make you uncomfortable because it's going to force you to look at a lot of that stuff. And personally, when I first started working with a nutrition coach, I never did. It was very black and white. It was like, here are these macros, hit them. But I was also at a point in my life, I was like 22. And I was really still trying to figure out who I was. I was not asking myself those types of questions. Mm -hmm. And it took the next couple of years and experiences that I was having, relationships that I was in, jobs that I had that I liked that I didn't like, navigating living in a new city, just, you know, managing what college does not prepare you for in terms of adulthood, that I started to learn a lot about myself. And mm -hmm. sometimes the nutrition piece, the going to the gym, being super stupidly consistent with that, I think now today I can say almost 10 years later, was for a sense of thinking that I had control when there was other stuff that I just wasn't ready to deal with. And I wasn't ready mm -hmm. to face. I wasn't having conversations with friends about that. It wasn't until I started going to therapy that I would realize things like I love cleaning and I have to have my apartment like super neat. And my therapist pointed out to me because it turned into like a contentious thing inside of my relationship that I was actually doing that for a sense of control. And I wanted my partner to be on board with that too. And I wasn't approaching it in a way that was productive for us. So it's just that control word is really interesting because we can manipulate it. Oh yeah. We lie it again, easy way to lie to ourselves. Yeah. And we'll focus on the thing that really doesn't matter because exactly. Why not? And we'll right. make it so meaningful, right? We'll make mm -hmm. it a mountain. This is the thing. I'm like, that's not the thing. No. Mm. Yeah. No, it's not. So let's keep going with your part of the story of where we actually transition into making artwork because I think it was at the end of this conference, it was to make a sweatshirt or something like that. So tell us. Yeah. More. So, so the whole work, so it is a multi week, multi month process. So okay. call it half a year. Okay. Um, we're graduating. I'm designing a hoodie because we all wear the same hoodie for graduation. Cool. Mind you, we have no idea what's coming at us because there's a lot of intense stuff coming at us, but we don't share any of that. But anyway, um, so that's our unifying factor. And my buddy who was already doing a thing called Beautify Lincoln, running around the streets and kind of putting up murals um, to beautify it. Cool. Saw it. He's like, that has to be a mural. And Well, no, he said that needs to go on a wall. And I said, what, like a mural? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, all right. Okay. He's like, I'll get the wall. 
you design and do the mural and then we'll convince anyone that this is a community service project. So that's what led to the first mural. And I turned that design. That design doesn't look anything like the mural, but it's strongly inspired by it. And it said, who will you be? Question mark. Because I'm like, I don't see anything in the world reminding me of who I need to be. I see everything in the world reminding me of living from fear, right? I need to, to be a man. I need to go buy this new F-150. Nothing against Ford. I'm not dogging any brands <laughs> who I need to be I'm escaping my life let me go watch the movies again I love movies none of this stuff is bad it's just how we use it yeah the, some of the bad things I think because if we're talking fitness here everyone's always looking for the quick fix the quick pill mm -hmm. right Ozempic is the thing right now mm -hmm. or it's freeze the fat you look at a billboard I'm just gonna get lipo I'm not gonna work out cool learn how the body works you lipo it all out of here guess what now your face is this big because yeah. you're still Still really eating bad you're still not working out right like there is no quick fix you gotta we didn't get to the root yourself. cause yeah so again that mural is like who will you be right there ask it every day and on this side were multiple choice answers 80 different words um worthy responsible joyful love humble grateful like you name it just tons of words so that every day i can go look at it and be like you know what today i need to be a leader Today, I need to feel worthy. Shit, yeah. today, I need to be more humble. Or today, I need to be more joyful. So I was able to start looking at that. And then my thought, I still, I had no idea the power of what I could do with a mural. It just, it was just like, draw, giant building. Cool. Didn't think about it further than that. But then I started thinking this whole thing through with the work I was doing and how I could impact people. One of the stories I thought through, well, doing this is right across the street there's a starbucks this is on lincoln boulevard pier here's a starbucks whole foods is a little bit further up so it's high traffic street later i learned 40 to fifty thousand people at any given moment are driving by this wall but then i'm picturing like what if i'm the barista getting up at 4 30 a.m to get there at five half asleep miserable is the only job i can get as i'm paying for school like you if you start realizing like what people People go through and then all of a sudden you start serving coffee and then someone shows up who's angry depressed not grateful and like give me my coffee like da, 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 gives attitude and now that's like a contagious energy going forward and this poor little barista is getting berated but now they take that all on and now we're just like spreading crappy energy because at some yeah. point they're gonna snap at somebody else sure and so i'm like well what if i could create something where that person's about to do that and they look at the wall like you know what let me be grateful for them being here right now and doing this for me as i go sit in two hours of traffic to get my i'm just thinking like could this make people think and operate differently but that's what i was doing to myself we're mirrors of each other so i was saying hey if i saw this can i change how i cool next level is does it could it affect people hopefully and Lo and behold, it did. And there was incredible feedback. And the more murals I painted, the more messages I put out there, people would interact with it and open up and talk about being raped and talk about alcoholism and talk about suicidal tendencies and talk about battling with what chemo did to them and not feeling very empowered and, and beautiful and how wow. that was disconnecting them with their daughters. Like, and I'm just sitting here like there is, I just got to keep going. But from the first mural, did I think any of this? No, it was just no. like community service project, mural, cool art. I still wasn't like, I'm going to be an artist. Yeah. It's just every mural for the next three years. I'm like, there's something bigger to this and I need to keep saying yes and just listen and keep going. This is when I say like, what is our why? We don't need to really know it, but our, the world, the universe, God, whoever you believe in or what you believe in is showing us a way. And if we're open enough to listen and out of autopilot and out of fear and martyrdom and victimhood, we can see everything that's around us. And that's all coming from love. So if we operate from fear or we operate from love, 
And everything falls under that. That's what I say. If you're anxious, you're in fear. If you're worried, you're in fear. If you're in doubt, you're in fear. All these things are in fear. And asterisk again, fear is a good thing. Like we need it to protect us. I'm not saying it is the devil and the enemy, but when we live in it and operate from it and have it alter who we are, that's where it's a bad thing, right? If you feel yeah. fear because a car is coming barreling at you and you're about to get hit, obviously that's a reason to be fearful. Like sure. Don't say, I'm going to choose love here and pretend <laughs> it's not good. But when you're operating out of love, then you're like, you know what? I'm worthy. I belong here. I can problem solve. I'm not a victim. I'm a leader. Like, let's respond. We're in fear. We're reacting. And reacting is that gut check. You get cut off. You flick them off. It's that just instant anger, turning red, whatever it is that your trigger is, or you could just clam up and go hide in the cave. It's like either or, but that's your reaction. What's your reaction? Mm -hmm. Reaction comes from autopilot. It doesn't really come from being aware of what's happening. Another thing is it's a practice though, right? I still react sometimes. I still go get depressed sometimes. I just have tools now and things that I can lean into to get me out of those places quicker. We're human. We're going to feel it all. We're going to experience it all. You know, we will have multiple cases of the fuck it's until we're gone. And yep. it's okay. We just don't need that case of fuck it's to be more than a day. It doesn't have to be three years. And then you're a hundred pounds heavier. Mm -hmm. But if you need to eat two pizzas that one night, go for it. Eat the pizza, right. eat the ice cream. Not going to kill you. But then also realize why you did it. Like, you know, so that's that's just how it kept going so for the next three years i'm still in finance okay I'm that's moving, what i wanted to moving, ask you like lighting i'm kind okay. of sabotaging the business okay you know my ga is pissed off at me he's like dude you were like one of the best at this the way you deal with people like you, you can be an x top percent producer in the country i'm like yeah i don't care i hate this so i'm just biding my time until figuring it out but then I don't know what art looks like. I'm like, what the hell is this? How do I make money at art? No one sure. taught me this. And how if does you this look become at, a business? Yeah. And if you look at the world, I mean, now it's way different with creator economy, social media, mm -hmm. YouTube, everything is blowing it up. So right. the opportunities are more vast. Um, not to discount it, but no. It's it's just you went to school to be a graphic designer and that's about it. And like there are obviously are art schools and art majors, but how many people, you know, in the last 20 years do you know actually went to art school? My wife actually went to art school, funny enough. But uh But half the time if they went, they wind up doing something completely different because let's go uh -huh. back to the money thing. They're like, I can't be a starving artist. Yeah. So then I've gotta, you know, put my money where my mouth is and try to really figure out like if i'm doing the work if i'm being responsive i'm taking this you know being the leader in my life what does this look like how do i make it look and then i just had to ask myself like ruben you've made money out of nothing your entire life so that conversation's off the table cool but but never knew how to turn it into a business so i i would do some murals that were just brand deals right like <laughs> gt's kombucha hired me to paint 30 foot tall or 20, 20 foot tall bottles on a 30 foot tall wall. Like imagine if this is a GT's kombucha uh -huh. logo Bottle. and everything. Yeah. And we painted them in their facility. Cool. And I'm like, Oh, that paid some bills. Okay. Let's figure this out. What I did know is I didn't want to go be a painter or a work for hire, put up people's things. Cause I sure. started creating this messaging so you wanted whenever, to fit within the messaging, right? like you wanted to be true to that. Yeah, exactly. So knowing that I didn't go down that path of like, if I was focused on money, I would have gone down that path. Mm -hmm. Who knows where that would have led, but that wasn't the case. It's like, I need money. I need to pay my bills. I need to feed myself and fund all the awesome, inspiring murals that I want to do that at sure. first I just had to, Hey, can I paint this and make the conversation so loud it become something and it's just consistency. Like today, I, I saw this quote on consistency, and then I reframed it to, and I'm just looking at it because a lot of people ask, how did you get to this point? You show up every single day and everything that you do. So consistency is the thing that sets you apart. It's sure not is. necessarily skill. It's not necessarily talent. It's not necessarily luck or blah, 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 blah. But like consistency can actually create your luck. 
consistency can amplify your talent. Because if you start looking at it, so day in, day out, you just keep showing up and you never know what's going to happen. Day in and day out, you eat good food and nutrition, your body's going to change. Day in, day out, you go into the gym, your fitness is going to change, body's going to change. You're going to feel better. You're going to look better. You're going to love yourself more. So it's just every single day showing up consistently and doing it, even when you don't want to. Because trust me, there's a lot of times when you don't want to. Yeah. And 2018, I finally said, you know what? I can't. I lived in this. I call it mediocre. Bookerville because I'm like sabotaging okay. finance, but I'm not really letting art have art. a thing because I don't sure. know what it looks like. Yeah. And I said, you know what? Peace. I'm out. Finance. Here's my book of business. You can have it. I didn't even try to sell it. This is how much I was really like, I can't live this wow. life. I'm like, here, have it. I'm out. And here we are. I think this is the perfect time for me to ask you the question I mentioned when we were kind of prepping for the show. Something that's really stood out for me in just hearing your whole story and observing the decisions that you've made and the timeline in which you made it is I think that in my own experience, like I shared with you, I was often labeled in trying to transition job positions, figure out my purpose, really. It was a part of the journey of me figuring out my purpose, but I was in finance went into fitness. Fitness was always a side hustle. And to steal your line about Mediocreville, I was in a position like that for a while where I had a job with an asset manager. I was bored as hell. I was super underutilized and they knew it. And half the time I was sitting there working on projects for the gym that I was also working for on the side. And at one point that presented me the opportunity to go work for that gym full time. I took it, but things started to change and working there full time at at first I loved it. I was like, this is my dream position. But after about a year, I started to get really burnt out. I wasn't taking care of myself. I was taking care of everybody else and their fitness and running the gym and saying yes to everything and the crazy hours and everything that came with it. And I just got to a point where no matter how much I loved it, I couldn't continue that way. So that led me to reconsider. Should I go back to a corporate job? Don't have to work weekends not begging for time off, not negotiating to still continue to get paid if I don't teach a class, you know, all the external things that you could be like, well, is this really practical? Mm -hmm. And in that, I started getting met with this story from a lot of the people that were interviewing me. Most of them were probably 10, 15, maybe even 20 plus years, my senior. And they labeled me as the typical millennial who within three years had three different jobs and she was therefore a liability and she couldn't decide what she wanted to do and was all over the place. And that really got to me. I started to believe that was actually true. And I shared with you that led to a big depression, but I want to know and hearing everything for you, I feel like that's what's made you really unique because I think so many people in your positions that you've been in in the past and the roles that you had, especially, and I'm not trying to stereotype, but I think this is especially true in finance in particular, is like people get to some of these banks and these different institutions and they just go to die there basically. Like that's going to be their one job. They're going to be at that one firm for 30 years. And you can interpret the go to die there statement a couple of different ways, right? Based on what we've been talking about up until this point for the last almost hour but I want to know, like, if you look back on every decision you've made in your career and your journey, why do you think you kind of broke the mold of not being the person who was just going to say, yep, I'm going to keep this one job. I'm going to stay the course. Do you think it was because of the experience with bankruptcy and then having a total detachment to money? Like, what do you think it was for you? Because I think that if let's say I've rewound three, four years ago and you were interviewing me for a job because of the experience you've had, I don't think you would have judged me the way that I was often judged. Mm -hmm. First, I'll say that judgment was them judging themselves and whatever issues they had. You're right. And I couldn't Just see that at the time, time, but now it makes sense. But uh, the, ba the bankruptcy obviously played a role with it. I think there's a couple of things here to answer this. And just looking at experience and studying humans and dealing mm -hmm. with people we create traps for ourselves. And then when we create this trap, it's really hard to get out of the trap. Yeah, right? very hard. Yeah. The American dream of let me buy the house and the white picket fence and the da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Yo, 
I've been in finance long enough to know that the minute you buy a house, that isn't an investment. I don't care what you subscribe to, flipping homes, vacation homes, all that stuff is investment. But the house you buy to live in, that is debt. That is a liability. And guess what you can't do when you have a $10,000 mortgage? You can't just pack up and say, I hate this job. I got to move on. So part of it is that we build these prisons for ourselves that we can't get out of. Mm. Uh, and that first time that I did that, even though I was self-employed and I was loving what I was doing, I built this prison of boats and cars and bikes and all these payments of sure. things that I owed. And how do you stay in that or try to get out? of? Well, you have to make way more money to pay it off or continue that treadmill yeah. that I was running on. When you lose it all in bankruptcy, you're like, yo, there's something different in life. I don't hope anyone goes bankrupt, okay? Because like you have to rebuild your credit. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, but in the second case, when I rebuilt myself, took myself back up in finance, I didn't buy all the things. I had a car and I, I just didn't put the overhead on myself and I just didn't want to do it. So I didn't build this prison. I had different prisons, you know, this is how I'm supposed to be to be successful. I still had all that stuff to deal with, but I think a lot of it comes down to our self-imposed prisons because we're trying to buy the car to show off to the friend that we don't really care about or the house to, I don't know, do what, because, you know, my <laughs> wife and I want a house and the house we buy, I always say, this is the house I want to raise our kids in. This is a debt. This it's not an investment. It's because I want to be here, create memories. There's a lot of value. Yeah. I'm not saying don't buy a house, but just- But it's where you're planting your... yourself. Exactly. What's your frame around it? I want to raise my kid here. The school's here. Like, Do it for those reasons. We want to entertain people, but sometimes it's just more to say, like, I have a house. I'm like, that's not yeah. the right reason. So those are a few things of what keep us in this. We create these prisons. But ultimately, it's because we live in fear. And it's it's what we're supposed to do. And because maybe we're not thinking creatively enough was what could our life look like if we chose a different path? How can we shift to go down this new path? So we get stuck in analysis paralysis. We get stuck in fear. We don't think it's possible, even though we see a million and one people do it around us all the time, which helps you know us that are inspiring and have the opportunity to inspire people every single day which is why I'm like really cautious with how I say things, right? I don't say go up and quit your job tomorrow. Like practice. Can you generate money from your side hustle? Mm -hmm. Is it something you really want to do? Do you want to build out a plan? Is it to a point where you can kind of quit, obviously downsize some things and help this thing grow and do it? Because if you just jump off a cliff, that's a whole nother thick skin that, you know. Sure that's, is. That's a different yeah. thing. But I think it's that. It's, it's our own self-imposed those prisons and we don't think and sometimes choices you know we don't think we're actually making the choice and by not making the choice the choice is being made for us like choices are always being made so unless you actually say no i'm not doing this or yes i am doing this you know someone may have made the choice for you so i mean I think that's how i could kind of answer that i hope that answers that yeah i love it the but choices are always being made piece like even you not making a choice, giving up that opportunity, like doing nothing, so to speak, is a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so true. But, but like the next time you buy that thing, why? Like we share a car now. I have a, te the wife has a Tesla. I have an old classic truck. It's my daily driver. You know, I had a really cool uh, sponsorship with BMW. So for three years, I had a free BMW. You know, so it was really awesome. So I got spoiled with no car payments. Yeah. And then when that contract's over, you're like looking at car payments and I'm like, do I really need another car? Sure. Do I really like, do we, th there's a lot of things we do in life. We don't. And if I got another car payment, I'm also not going to get a crappy beater. I'm going to get a nice car. I'm like, I don't want to spend 1200 a month. So just think about like some people probably don't want to spend 1200, but the reason they want it is greater than the not wanting to spend the money. Mm. So, and that, I think that's just from being in a hundred percent entrepreneurial self-funded person and also losing it all and, sure. and realizing that, but 
financial freedom doesn't mean you have to be a billionaire. Just what's the freedom? What does the life look like? I like, we like to travel and I don't want a bunch of cars sitting there parked. That you're not even driving. Yeah, sure. No, that's a great point. Well, it's already been a long conversation. I probably could talk to you for like three hours, but I do want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to bring us to our last couple of questions here. And I didn't share this with you before we started, but I like to end with like a little fun lightning round. So quick rapid fire questions. If any of them turn into a longer response, I'm not timing you. So we're not strict about it. So you mentioned that you were a CrossFitter. You still train that way. So I'm going to ask you some fitness questions first for this. If you could only do one movement, like one exercise, one lift, whatever, for the rest of your life, what is it and why? Yeah. It's hard. One, one lift. Just one. One lift. Only one. Power clean. Okay. Full Tell clean. Full, full clean. Full clean. Because I can move the most amount away from the ground to the floor to get fitness applied to most of my entire body at any given moment. And I could switch it up. If it's lightweight, I could go really fast for high cardio. If it's heavyweight, then I'm adding strength base to it. So it's going to be the exercise that hits everything if I can only do one thing. Love it. Super practical. Great answer. On the other end of the spectrum, what's your least favorite exercise? Like if you could get rid of something, you'd never do it again if you didn't have to. Oh, well, I already don't do them. Uh, handstand pushups and pistols. I gave you okay. two. There you go. Those are good ones. I, I would I would count myself out of both of those as well. Mm-hmm. Food. If you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, every meal, what is it? Uh, is it one food or like a type of you could do- meal? You could do a cuisine. How about that? Like a type of meal. Well, I would like do a Mediterranean food, like the Greek salad with some rice and kebab on a stick. I could probably eat that forever and it kind of touches all the things. Are you just trying to be super practical with that answer too, to also maintain your health and longevity? Like what if there was no consequences? It's not even about consequence. It's about getting bored. Okay. There you go. I'm looking That's at fair. what can I eat? Variety. And... Yeah. I kind of eat almost the same thing all the time. I don't do. I eat. I eat all the things. Like, but yeah. What's your favorite restaurant in LA? Oh man, that's hard. It's we kind of go to the same. Spot. You Let can toss out a couple. Okay. Favorite pizza spot in LA is Pizzana. That's it. Pizzana. Favorite sushi to go to eat at home is Sugarfish. Nice. I love sushi. Okay. Last question. If somebody listening to this could only have one key takeaway from our entire conversation and we covered a whole lot, what's the one thing you'd want them to leave with? Taking inventory of the entire conversation. I think it's going to go back to that consistency thing. Cause if you take one lesson from this and you just consistently apply it to whatever it is that you're trying to do, you're going to get results. Awesome. Well, Ruben, this has been amazing. I really enjoyed our conversation. I got so much from it and I really appreciate you and your time and everything that you shared. So most importantly, if any of the Fix listeners want to stay connected with you, they want to find you, where are you on social media, the internet, plug yourself. Everything's basically my name. Uh, Ruben, R-U-B-E-N, not the sandwich, Rojas, R-O-J-A-S. That's the website, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, but then there's a hyphen. Okay. The or live through love. Uh, the podcast is live through love. So if you just Google that, everything will show up. Perfect, and we'll plug all of it in the show notes too. So we got it covered. Well, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm very excited to hear the feedback on this episode. And for everybody who listened to us today, you guys know the drill. If you got something from this conversation, and I don't know how you possibly could not have please share it, throw it up on your Instagram stories, text it to a friend. Maybe there's something in here that you've wanted to have a conversation with someone and you don't know how to navigate it. A podcast is a really good way to kind of open that up and have that discussion. So share it. If you like it It takes three seconds, go ahead and leave us a review, a five-star review, just smash those five stars or whatever it is on, depending on the platform that you're on. And from wherever you are listening from, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.